In 1991, a group of eight adventurers stepped into a massive glass and steel structure in the desert hills above Tucson, Arizona. As the door swung closed behind them, it marked the official starting point of an ambitious experiment that had been almost a decade in the making. Was it possible to survive in a parallel, closed-off Earth for two years? To prepare for their mission, the group had spent years traveling the world collecting the specimens necessary to recreate five major biomes under the roof of a greenhouse. They weren't sure what would survive and what wouldn't, so they packed their new house full of all the species that they could find and hoped for the best. There was a coral reef, tropical forest, a desert, and even a marshland to purify their wastewater. Biosphere 2 wasn't just an extended performance piece, though it was plenty theatrical, with tourists coming by to watch the biospherians living under glass. It was more of an artistic and scientific attempt to draw public attention to a pressing question. What does it mean for humans to keep growing on a finite Earth? Our conversation with one of these biospherians, Mark Nelson, got us thinking about how the idea of growth is deeply embedded in the human instinct. Each human is, at the time of birth, the newest link in an unbroken chain that stretches back to the earliest life forms on Earth. Having lots of babies, adding more links to the chain, has been a foundational strategy for success up to this point. But things on Earth are changing, and this has resulted in a divided mindset. On one hand, growth offers renewal, novelty, and a sense of forward momentum. On the other hand, there's always this looming sense of the disastrous consequences of exploding populations in other species. Locusts, mice, algal blooms, that first destroy everything around them as they bloom, and then, at the end, themselves. However, there's an argument that can be made for reimagining the doomsday perspective, and we present it here in three parts. First, an exploration of growth, then a brief comparative study of boom and bust versus what we're calling meanwhile strategies, where growth transitions into a sustained rhythm, and finally an attempt to answer the central question, what does life after growth look like? Chapter 1. The Looming Catastrophe. The year of exponential growth has a long tradition in the upper echelons of society where environmental problems have a simple solution. Just have fewer people. But that doesn't actually make sense. Fewer people would mean less robust economic growth and less opportunity for innovation. So where does the fear actually come from? Early arguments for controlling the population can be traced back to Thomas Malthus in the 1790s, who wrote an alarmist treatise about the fact that human populations were growing too fast and everyone was going to starve to death if something wasn't done sooner rather than later. He pointed to historical data, which suggested that the number of people increased geometrically, meaning they doubled with each generation while the food supply merely rose linearly. Predictions of widespread famine were overblown as a series of agricultural innovations, everything from mechanical combines to the synthetic fertilizers invented in the early part of the 20th century, significantly increased efficiency of farmland. All of the food consumed by a human today is grown on half as much land as it was in the 1900s. Despite this, environmentalists in the 1960s and 70s were still sounding the alarm on the subject of overpopulation. Paul Ehrlich's The Population Bomb is a classic of the genre, where he explores the idea of mass sterilization campaigns that add chemical sterilants to food and water, as well as ceasing food aid to famine-prone areas of the globe, as he believed there is, quote, no hope that aid will lead them to self-sufficiency. Today, he is president of the Conservation Biology Department at Stanford University. What? It's true. Many have disavowed this nearly sociopathic perspective on the human species, but the thread of population alarmism frequently recurs. A 1992 letter from the Union of Concerned Scientists with 1,500 signatories urged action on decreasing the population. One third of Nobel laureates polled in 2017 suggested that overpopulation was a leading problem. That same year, there was another letter, this time with 15,000 signatories, that reiterated that the number of humans on the planet was going to lead to catastrophe and something had to be done. Concern about the planet hovering on the brink of collapse is widespread in pop culture as well. Media outlets like Vice, Vox, and The Guardian have caught on to the idea that, in addition to being evil, blaming overpopulation for the state of the Earth doesn't actually make any sense. The people in the most populous countries are the poorest, and so have the smallest environmental footprints. Others, though, continue beating on the too many people drum. Michael Moore, who has made 13 movies about how various institutions, from Nike factories to the American healthcare system, are fundamentally broken, 
trotted out the overpopulation claim in his most recent film, Planet of the Humans. Constant fear of humanity degrading the Earth has clearly dug its way into people's heads, and it's there to stay. Groups that are centered on civilization collapse and prepping for apocalypse have roughly 2 million members between Facebook and Reddit. All of this is driven by a vision of exponential growth that treats human beings as a windfall species. Those whose populations periodically explode far beyond what the environment can endure and just as quickly collapse into nothing. This story turns out to be nothing more than a salacious fiction that treats humans as a plague, rather than a species whose ability to solve problems can enable it to thrive long past the end of growth. Chapter 2, Windfall versus Meanwhile Biological growth is defined as an increase in biomass over time. Just as an individual grows from a 5-pound baby to a 200-pound adult, populations can go from a few individuals to billions of creatures. But it can't go on forever, if only because resources will eventually run out, waste will build up, or conditions will change. When any of these happen, life faces two options, either switch from growing to dying, or find a viable alternative. If a species follows the former pattern, then it's thought to follow a windfall strategy, the animal equivalent to winning the lottery and then going broke within a few years. Algal blooms are a great example of this type of growth. They have a yearly cycle that's dependent on temperature and nutrients. Hot summer days, abundant fertilizer runoff from farm fields and slow moving water. When all three conditions are present, algae populations can quickly overtake all other life in a body of water. Then, they vanish almost as quickly as they emerged, killing all of the life that remained, as bacteria feeding on the algal bodies devour the dissolved oxygen. Larger creatures can also follow the windfall pattern. Locusts are currently ravaging the Horn of Africa, or swarms the size of cities blanket the countryside and devour enough food per day to feed 35,000 people. Australia is currently infested with millions of mice that are destroying the fields, granaries, and running all over people's faces while they sleep. And in some areas, shopkeepers are killing five to six hundred mice a night, every night. Both outbreaks were brought about by an unexpected season of heavy rains, and history suggests that collapse will happen due to three main factors. A decrease in rainfall will curb reproductive rates, exhaustion of the food supply will lead to starvation, and predator populations will swell in response to the excess numbers. Little critters following exponential growth and decay curves somehow makes sense. Each female locust can lay roughly 240 eggs over the course of a two-week lifespan, and female mice can give birth to 150 pups in a single year. And yet, perhaps surprisingly, larger animals can be subject to the same constraints. Longer generation times and fewer babies born at a time mean that large animals are only capable of this type of growth in highly specific conditions. For example, there's one study in the literature about reindeer, but the circumstances were first contrived and then poorly managed. When the US bought Alaska from the Russians, they inherited two small islands, the Pribilofs, that the Russians had used as an Aleutian slave colony for the production of seal skins. Zoologist Victor Scheffer recounts how between 1910 and 1930, the reindeer herd grew from 25 to 2,000 individuals. And then, how between 1930 and 1940, it declined to only eight animals. His explanation? Overconsumption. The island that hosted the reindeer was nearly 400 miles from the mainland, which meant that it had developed in the absence of ungulates. When the deer were artificially introduced, the island was covered in their favorite food source, the aptly named reindeer moss. The lack of predators and the ample food supply meant that the population could increase to a point where consumption of the moss exceeded the rate at which the moss regrew, which pretty predictably led to total collapse. In all these examples, a familiar story plays out. An abundant resource is consumed with no thought to saving a surplus for later, allowing populations to grow far beyond the long-term capacity of their environment. The lack of resources for the next generation eventually leads to a communal demise, with few individuals around to restart the process at the next time the initiating factors appear again, just the right mix. This pattern of boom and bust is what those concerned about overpopulation imagine lies in store for the humans today. However, this version of events is by no means the default. Other organisms grow wildly but don't collapse, like what we're calling meanwhile species. Bacteria, ants, even trees who undergo a period of rapid expansion and then, with very little drama, switch over to an extended paradigm of cyclic renewal. 
Oscillatory behavior after growth can be seen in the lab, where a single bacterial cell, properly incubated in a few cups of broth, can produce billions of cells in as little as 24 hours. At this density, the bacteria are no longer in the actively dividing phase of existence. They've entered the meanwhile, or as scientists call it, the stationary phase. They're still alive, they perform normal cellular functions, but they aren't increasing in number. Scientists have shown that some bacteria can survive like this for at least five years, and this finding suggests that perhaps there's an alternative to boom and bust. Ants colonies are another example of a classic meanwhile species. During periods of nutrient abundance, the number of worker ants in the colony increases until some ceiling is reached. At this point, worker ants will produce a large quantity of winged princess ants, reproductively able creatures who leave the nest en masse when the weather turns hot, humid, and windless. After these female ants have mated, they find a spot to raise a few workers and then the process starts over again. The new queen raises a few of her eggs into workers and then sits back. Her job, except for providing a steady supply of fertilized eggs, is done. From this point on, the colony will grow in size until it gets to about 200,000 individuals, a process that takes about four to six years. In the previous examples, this would be the inflection point of disaster. But instead of collapse, this actually triggers another reproductive event, which halves the colony. A year later, the numbers recover, and the colony calves again. Meanwhile, behavior is also apparent on a slightly different scale, that of trees in the forests they comprise. There are two kinds of forests on Earth, old growth and successional. Old growth forests are those that have not been torn down by humans or hurricanes in at least a few hundred years, while successional forests are what grows in the aftermath of disaster. Early recovery from damage is a dynamic process, with the representation of species constantly changing as the tree canopy reforms. At the critical point of canopy closure, the forest starts the long and slow transition toward meanwhiling, a point when the trees have stopped reaching upwards and the species diversity is stabilized. Their work instead switches to accumulating the girth that's necessary to support the towering coronas and the species that live among them. In the tree, meanwhile, individual organisms have come together into a colony that can be stable for millions of years. A distinct transition in lifestyle between growth and maintenance has allowed all of these creatures to flourish. Bacteria are the oldest form of life on Earth, basically an unkillable branch of the tree of life that might even be inside the Earth and on Mars. Ants seem to be doing quite well for themselves. Recent work shows that a single megacolony of Argentine ants has taken over Europe, Japan, and parts of North America, making it the largest single colony on Earth. Forests, for now, still cloak 31% of the planet's surface, so the meanwhile model seems to be pretty successful. With all this laid out on the table, there's just one last thread to weave in. What's the deal with humans? Are you going to be creatures of windfall or of the meanwhile? Chapter 3. Heads or tails, humans? So far, we've examined two versions of the world. One which ends in chaos, another that ends in a new extension phase of life. But meanwhile, what are the ingredients of difference that lead one species down the path of boom and bust, while another manages to persist or even flourish when facing the most crowded conditions? It really seems to come down to three factors. The speed at which exponential growth occurs, the destructive nature of the full weight of the population, and an inherent ability, or lack thereof, to adapt to crowding. Species whose exponential growth is dependent on a transient resource, those whose consumption increases in direct relation to population size, and that are instinctive rather than adaptive, will most likely be unable to maintain their population peak. Mice, locusts, and algae all fit the bill here. On the other hand, species that are capable of these sorts of adjustments have a higher likelihood of survival, like ants that can start a new colony when things get too crowded, bacteria that start a separate genetic program for the long haul, and trees that transition into an old growth forest. The question is, now that crowding is at an all-time high for humans and population growth has started to slow down, which path is your species actually on? The popular doomsday argument that humans are a windfall species often rests on the idea that Earth has a specific carrying capacity and humans have overshot that figure. So the only solution is to get rid of the undesirables. But this turns out to be a lie. Carrying capacity isn't some absolute number handed down on a set of tablets. No, it's not. 
it's actually a range management term used by fish and wildlife departments in order to establish upper limits for grazing animals on a given parcel of land. But humans are managers, not the grazing animals, and they're capable of negotiating new terms in response to changing conditions. Perhaps there are genes that will become active in response to increased crowding that'll change the way humans behave, as is the case in bacteria after they're done with growth. Or maybe evolution will be mimetic, where consumption patterns shift to accommodate increased populations. Minimalist aesthetics do appear to be on the rise, and mass production has less appeal than ever before. It's possible to imagine a future where humans get a handle on the levers of power, and rewrite corporate incentives to balance the profit motive with maintenance of the commons. Or you'll develop efficient circular economies that stem the extractive processes that are the last vestiges of slavery on the planet. Or you'll secure right to repair and pass laws against planned obsolescence. There are those who suggest that the only way to avoid extinction is to push toward revolution and chaos, to force a windfall in order for the species and the planet to rebuild. But any kind of violent event that decreases population will inevitably lead humans right back to the physical limits that they face today. At the end of the day, that was the goal of the Biospherians, to find a way to live within a limited system, to demonstrate that there was an alternative to destruction. In some ways, the experiment failed. An unexpected reaction with the concrete foundation of the building depleted oxygen levels, interpersonal conflicts abounded, and many of the vertebrate species they introduced didn't actually make it. But humans are engineers, creatures that excel by building on failures. So although populations have grown enormously and waste has accumulated, that's actually the signal that's necessary to create a shift into the meanwhile. And people are taking notice, but taking control back from soulless corporations that simply answer to annual growth reports isn't going to be easy. So next week, we're starting an exploration of law, government, and civic action. We're going to explore all the ways that democratic governments have become isolated from their mission of serving the people, and how you humans can get them back on track. In the meanwhile, check out our conversation with Mark Nelson from Biosphere 2, and come back next week for a fresh investigation. Take care, humans. See you soon. Bye. Bye. You know, we're as important in the biosphere as microbes. Life does disturb equilibrium. So if you're looking for order, you know, take yourself to a dead planet and die, and you can be, you can be part of the background static there. Have courage and remember, humans are the most unstable element of the ecosystem.